Hi, I'm State Representative Jeffrey Elmore, and I represent Wilkes and Alexander counties in the North Carolina House for District 94. Uh, today I'm going to share with you, I guess what we're going to call our annual report. Uh, normally I report with you after each session of the biennium, the uh, long session and the short session. Uh, we are almost complete with the short session, but due to COVID-19, uh, we have extended it to September 3rd. But I wanted to go ahead and present the report today on the legislation that was passed during the short session and also talk to you a little bit about uh, the budget that was dealt with uh, in the short session. First of all, uh, we did not enact a full state budget. Uh, since the long session which happened uh, last summer, uh, the governor vetoed our budget and we were unable to override the veto. Uh, so we approached this session, especially due to COVID-19, from the aspect that we would be reacting to the pandemic and other needs that were happening to the state. So currently from a budgetary standpoint, we are on a continuation budget from the prior biennium. The short session will be ending September 3rd and the reason why we extended that is because there has been federal CARES money that was sent down in the spring in reaction to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are expecting a possible another round of CARES money uh, to come down from Washington. And hopefully that decision will be made at the federal level and we will have time to be able to appropriate those funds during the uh, last bit of session that will start on September 3rd. Uh, Governor Cooper announced that he would be extending phase two this week. Uh, it would be extended through September 11th. Uh, that's an additional five weeks of the mandates that have uh, been sent down through executive order. I get a lot of questions to my office. Uh, how does the governor, how is he able to do this? How is he able to do this through uh, executive order? and what is the General Assembly doing in reaction to it. Uh, there is nothing statutorily illegal about what uh, Governor Cooper is doing. The statutes are very clear that in a state of emergency, whoever declares the state of emergency first uh, has the ability to uh, issue orders in relation to that state of emergency. And that person is the only person that can lift the um, state of emergency. The uh, state law gives two entities that power, uh, the governor and also the General Assembly itself. So in reaction to COVID-19, Governor Cooper declared the state of emergency first, thus having the power to issue the executive orders. So there is um, nothing illegal with what he is doing um, in reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, there is no role for the General Assembly to truly void an executive order. Uh, we can pass legislation to try to react to the executive order, but it must pass both chambers and be signed by the governor. And um, in my report today, we'll talk about some of those bills that went through the process but were vetoed by Governor Cooper. First of all, I want to talk about what we did with uh, military families. North Carolina's goal is to become the uh, most friendly military state in the nation. Uh, we clarified some language for scholarships for children of wartime veterans. Uh, some of our veterans that served in Desert Storm uh, and some of the other conflicts that were in the Middle East, their children are now at the age uh, where they are going to college. And uh, we clarified some language to make it easier for those students to receive scholarship funds that they were entitled to because of their parents' service. Uh, we also did some uh, licensing reform, occupational licensing reform for military families. Uh, we had military families that were moving in from other states and the spouse of the person serving may have an occupational license in a particular field but they were unable to uh, practice their field in our state because of the regulations. This clarifies that so it makes uh, it easier for military spouses uh, to go into their career as they move into North Carolina. And also we um, created what was called the Military Stabilization Fund. And uh, this is targeted towards communities where our military bases are uh, to help them with needs uh, related to the military base being in their community. When COVID-19 pandemic first started, 
uh, Speaker Tim Moore, um, the Speaker of the House, uh, reacted very quickly with um, the chamber. And we started um, what were called the COVID-19 response committees. Uh, they were divided into different areas, um, education, commerce, et cetera, to talk about and develop and figure out what the needs were in reaction to what COVID-19 was doing. Uh, those committees were started very quickly after the uh, emergency declaration from the governor so we could react as quickly as possible. Uh, and these were bipartisan groups and we met uh, via Zoom for most of the meetings to determine what the needs were. Uh, we passed what was called the COVID-19 Recovery Act. Uh, this was Senate Bill 704 and this provided um, tax relief, also streamlined the unemployment access, increased health care flexibility, and it made policy reforms in education and government in reaction to the pandemic and the economic slowdown. Uh, we had to pass another act, which was called the Pandemic Response Act. Uh, this provided uh, nearly $1.6 in COVID-19 relief for small businesses, medical providers, education communities, and to increase our broadband connectivity uh, because so many of our folks are working from home, um, both in the education field and in all fields, really. Uh, and the goal is to increase our broadband connectivity. Um, we passed another bill in relation to COVID relief, uh, which was um, House Bill 1023. Uh, and this provided nearly a half a billion dollars in coronavirus relief that filtered to local governments, community health care services, job retention grants, and programs for vulnerable populations. Uh, it also contained funding for school nutrition programs, hospitals, health clinics, group homes, and child advocacy centers. Uh, this shot of money was to help with the increased need uh, due to the pandemic. Something I worked on personally was uh, we realized real quick with the shutdown that many of our kids that were going through driver's education programs were unable to complete their class and also unable to do the driving part of um, the driver's ed requirement. We also had students that were unable to get their license at age 16 because DMV was not conducting road tests. Uh, so uh, we passed a piece of legislation, uh, House Bill 158, that uh, basically created a waiver for those road tests and some waivers for the course requirement. Uh, this allowed uh, our driver's ed programs not to be so backed up because most of this activity takes place during the summer. And it also allowed the students that were so excited to get their license at age uh, 16, it allowed them to get that license so they could go ahead and get on the road. And since the legislation passed, uh, DMV has also waived the road test for drivers that are over 18 uh, because they're unable to give those. Uh, we did several actions in supporting the economic recovery uh, because of the downturn uh, dealing with COVID-19 and the lack of movement of folks. So we passed a bill called Small Business Relief. Uh, this provided almost $125 million for uh, a program through Golden Leaf that would provide bridge loans for small businesses as they face the pandemic. Uh, we also, as part of Senate Bill 704, we put some tax relief in there and what this did, it waived the interest payments on state income tax and business taxes, and we adjusted the tax filing to, min to mirror the relief provided by the IRS at the federal level. Uh, so th this is where, uh, when you, if you had to t file your income tax late, uh, you did not have to pay um, penalties with interest. Uh, we also created through a bill a job retention grant uh, this allocated $15 million for uh, job retention grants to businesses and nonprofits uh, that retained at least 90% of their jobs during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this was to help businesses that had to take uh, PPP loans, uh, that's the payroll protection um, loans to the federal government. They also would qualify for this to help stabilize them uh, through the effects of the pandemic. Uh, we also uh, did some support for our uh, travel and tourism industry, which has taken a big hit due to uh, COVID-19 restrictions. And uh, this allocated $5 million uh, to help stimulate um, the travel and tourism industry. Uh, 
Now, something we did try to do uh, fr uh, with one of the executive orders is we passed a bill to safely reopen uh, bars and gyms. Um, this bill went through the chambers, but by a slim margin, and the governor vetoed the bill. And because we do not have, the Republicans do not have a supermajority in either chamber, uh, we were unable to override the veto. So the veto stood. Uh, we passed a similar bill that also would have safely reopened parks, bowling alleys, arcades, and skating rinks, and it went through the same process. It passed uh, both chambers with good support, but we were unable to override the veto of the governor. Uh, something we did uh, for our restaurant industry was that we de delayed ABC permit fees. Uh, this is the permitting fees that they have to pay for their liquor license, and because of the downturn uh, and the capacity restrictions that are on the restaurants, uh, what we did is we created a delay for those business owners. Something that was interesting in the delivery business, uh, we had requests from entities like UPS and FedEx uh, that they were going to start using robots for deliveries in some areas and the statutes were not clear if that could be done. Uh, we clarified that as people are increasing their ordering online and having home deliveries. Uh, we also provided uh, $2 million to strengthen the state's Division of Employment Security uh, to enhance its fraud and compliant alert system. Uh, this was in reaction to all of the unemployment claims that were being made and that are still being made um, dealing with COVID-19. The role of broadband, we have done so much work on expanding broadband across the state of North Carolina, but with the pandemic, we've realized that we still have shortcomings uh, when it comes to broadband. There's many people across the state that do not have access to high-speed internet. So one thing that we did, we created the GREAT program, and this appropriated uh, $10 million and um, additional to the $15 million that was already in the fund. So it created a special $30 million round of funding um, to create a grand total of $64 million worth of investment to help companies expand fiber lines into rural areas of the state. Uh, that's very exciting. Uh, we have some of the highest speed internet in the state in District 94, but there are still spots in Wilkes and Alexander County that do not have access. So uh, these funds will help companies be able to get fiber to those areas. To piggyback on that, we also passed what was called the Satellite Broadband Grant. Uh, these are grants where fiber may be impossible to get uh, to a particular service area, especially in our far western part of the state and also some of the island communities that exist on our coast. Uh, what this grant is set up for is for expansion of satellite internet. So this is uh, where it would go over the air instead of using fiber lines in the ground. A big concern in the district has also been what has happened with DOT. Uh, DOT has faced a lot of financial pressures due to the pandemic because gas sales have gone down, also wholesale oil prices have gone down. Both of, both of those affect revenues going into the Highway Transportation Trust Fund. There also was a report from the State Auditor's Office that found that there were several issues of mismanagement of money and waste in the Department of Transportation. What this created is, uh, between those different factors, a major shortfall, and therefore a stint of time, uh, many of the projects that were happening were stopped immediately because of cash flow issues. Uh, there is a project, uh, Lydell Road in Alexander County, also the 268 project, uh, seems to be moving very slow. So in reaction to that, uh, we passed what was called the DOT Overhaul and Reform Act. This restructures the Board of Transportation uh, to where the uh, General Assembly will have appointments to the Board of, of Transportation, and it also increases their role in oversight. Uh, to where there is a better accountability in the department as they are making those decisions. Uh, hopefully this piece of legislation will help solve some of the mismanagement problems that was going on in the Department of Transportation. Now in the sector of agriculture, uh, we passed uh, three things that I want to focus on. First was the Farm Act. Uh, the Republicans for the past decade have uh, passed a Farm Act each session 
looking at burdensome regulations that are on our farms that just don't really make a lot of common sense. Also dealing with the marketing end of North Carolina grown products. Uh, we passed that, uh, a specific part of it was dealing with the Sweet Potato Commission. Uh, we are the second largest producer of sweet potatoes in the nation, uh, and that helped with marketing efforts for uh, them. Uh, we also provided $50 million for rural and underserved communities for uh, health provider grants, Medicaid assistance, enhanced teleservices, uh, critical services for transportation, health care security uh, for the uninsured. Uh, this was uh, part of House Bill 1043. And this affects our large farming communities because a lot of those infrastructure needs are just not there in their community. Uh, something else that was worked on, that I personally worked on and was passed, was the uh, establishment of a $10 million small meat processing plant grant. Uh, we were finding with our small farmers that they were unable to uh, take their cattle to be able to have it processed. And many of them, because of the financial situation currently, they wanted to um, make their herd a little bit smaller, sell off a couple of uh, heads of cattle to generate some cash to help with cash flow issues. Well, the small meat processors are so backed up due to um, the change in buying patterns because of COVID. Um, some of our small farmers were getting uh, dates February 2021 before the processor could get to uh, process their head of cattle. So what this does is it helps those small meat processors with workforce training, also equipment, to be able to try to help with that backup. Uh, those grants are open currently, and I'm very excited about that because that will not only help the small meat processors, it'll also help our, our small beef farmers. Uh, in the area of health care in this um, short session, we passed Senate Bill 361, which was entitled Healthy NC. And uh, this dealt with what's called step therapy. Uh, it was um, basically insurance companies with folks, uh, especially who have cancer, were requiring that certain drugs had to be used before you could move to another drug. Uh, and for many of the patients, by the time they went through this process, um, they may not still be alive. So what this does, this clarifies this so the doctor is more empowered uh, with the relationship with their patient to determine what drug is best for them. Uh, this has been worked on for probably over a decade and very happy to see that passed. We also passed Senate Bill 808, which is the Medicaid Funding Act. Uh, what this did, this uh, ensured that our Medicaid system would be funded and it also ensured that our Medicaid reforms will continue. Uh, it, gave, it gave a date certain to the Department of Health and Human Services to enact our uh, Medicaid reform efforts. So all of that is stable. So anything that you hear that Medicaid is being underfunded, um, this money protects uh, that program. We also did some hospital support uh, due to COVID because of the increased need there. Uh, it provided um, 65 million for rural hospitals, 15 million for North Carolina teaching hospitals, and a $15 million for general hospital relief fund due to increased cost for uh, PPE, bed space, et cetera. Uh, we also uh, included some money for uh, medical school research dealing with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we sent $29 million to the uh, UNC School of Public Health, uh, $20 million to Wake Forest uh, to conduct an antibody, st antibody study, 15 million to Duke uh, in um, vaccine development, and 15 million to East Carolina University uh, Brody School of Medicine, and 6 million to Campbell University School uh, of Medicine. Uh, the goal of those money is to help with research that deals with vaccines, also the antibody tests that seem very important. Now dealing with education, as you know, uh, both systems here in Wilkes and Alexander have chosen option B under the executive order, which means that the schools will be at 50% capacity with students and also students have an option to do remote only. Um, to keep all of this going, uh, we did several things in the area of education. First, we did what was called teacher and staff raises, Senate Bill 818. Uh, what this bill provided for is it 
ensures that teacher pay will not be frozen. So if a teacher was entitled to their next step uh, on the pay scale, this prevents that from um, not happening. Before in um, budget disputes, teachers pay would be frozen. This will prevent this from happening so they will get their entitled uh, increase that they were uh, supposed to get. It also provides a $350 bonus uh, to all of the education employees. It also requests to Governor Cooper, uh, he has $95 million of federal money that he's not expended uh, through the CARES Act that passed this spring. It asks that he provide $600 to each of the school employees out of that fund to give a grand total of $950 to the school employees. Um, we were unable to do any sort of pay raise to the pay scale this time because of the anticipated downfall of revenues, which is almost, uh, some estimates put it as high as $5 billion for the upcoming year, and that is $5 billion out of a $22 billion budget. Uh, we provided funding. The School of Science and Math in Morganton was set to open. Uh, we provided $3.3 million to ensure that that project does not get stopped. Uh, so we will have two schools of science and math, one in Durham and one in Morganton. That money kept that project going. Uh, we also uh, made sure that we funded the NC Promise tuition program. That's at three of our state universities where students are guaranteed a $500 uh, semester tuition rate. Uh, we also passed um, in House Bill uh, 1023 uh, school lunches. That's been a big issue during COVID. Uh, because many children, the only real stable meal they get each day is to the school. So we wanted to ensure with monies that those school lunch programs were not halted and that they would continue even through the pandemic. Uh, this provided uh, $500 million in corona, uh, the coronavirus relief bill. It is included almost $4 million to cover students that could not pay their reduced lunch fee like if they owe money, uh, that would backfill that for our school nutrition programs. It also provided $75 million for the summer nutrition programs uh, and $7 million for the schools to buy personal protective equipment. So all of those school nutrition programs or school lunch programs can continue and be stable. Uh, we also provided um, more funds for school-based mental health. Uh, this was a need prior to the pandemic and many of the school systems felt like the need would increase due to the pandemic. So we increased funding there to help get uh, more mental health professionals into our school system. Uh, something that passed the House overwhelmingly but got stalled in the Senate was something that I co-sponsored, which was the Education and Transportation Bond. Right now is a very cheap time to borrow money, and uh, what this would have done is issue funds for uh, transportation projects, uh, our community colleges, and also our K-12 schools. Uh, this bill was stalled in the Senate this short session, but uh, it had great support in the House. Um, the K-12 relief total COVID package, just to give you some numbers, uh, we provided uh, $70 million for summer learning programs, $11 million to improve uh, internet connectivity, in schools that already have the internet access, how can we create more Wi-Fi hotspots, et cetera. $30 million to uh, K-12 schools to buy additional computers and devices for the kids to be able to do their remote work. Uh, $10 million for the mental health professionals I mentioned prior. Uh, $5 million for devices for the teachers and staff that do not have those. $4.5 million for cybersecurity because as we increase the use of online learning, uh, there's more of a threat of hackers, et cetera, hitting the systems. And uh, $3 million for non-digital instructions for students with limited internet access. This is for kids that we just do not have the inter internet connectivity for them to help offset some of the cost of running all of the paper because uh, most of that was done through paper packets across the state. And uh, we also put $1 million specifically uh, for Wi-Fi routers for school buses. The total amount that was sent down to our public schools and our colleges and universities in the state, uh, excuse me, this is just K-12 schools, this number, $427 million uh, was sent down this year in reaction to 
COVID-19 in a combination of CARES money that we allocated and also direct funding to the schools themselves. So almost a half a billion dollars has already been issued to the schools. Um, we clarified um, education waivers at the end of this year. We did not require the standardized testing, uh, which was relief to many of our students uh, and also for our systems. An exciting thing too, we expanded the Teaching Fellows Program. Uh, I'm a former Teaching Fellow myself, it's a very good program, and currently only five um, institutions participate. This legislation will add an additional three for a total of eight schools participating in the Teaching Fellows Program, which helps get um, uh, more teachers into our classrooms. Uh, something that has been interesting in the past couple of years is uh, criminal justice reform. We have passed several measures uh, dealing with our criminal justice system and uh, trying to streamline some of that. Uh, what was passed this short session was called the First Step Act. This was House Bill 511. And what this does is we have mandatory minimums. And this has just been a combination of those that have happened over the past 50, 60 years. What this actually does is help give the judge uh, more discretion for low-level offenses. Uh, many people think that the judge has a lot of discretion in sentencing, but they really don't because our laws were so tight with minimal sentencing requirements. This helps create some flexibility to where the judges can make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Also, we passed what was called the Second Chance Act. Uh, this is for individuals that committed nonviolent misdemeanors or felony convictions that it makes the expungement process easier. This is where they can get their record clean. Uh, right now, uh, it's a very long period of time that they have to wait. Uh, also, they can only do it one time, and once they do it one time, it, it's done. Uh, this clarifies that to make it a little bit easier. This was, uh, had a lot of bipartisan support, even from the business community, uh, as it's very difficult for a person that has something on their record, even if it was committed 20 years ago, uh, to be able to uh, get a job. So uh, this will help out greatly. Uh, we also made it easier with our education in our prisons. Uh, we streamlined it to where the community college uh, can increase their course offerings. So a, folk, a person that is in prison, they can receive training so when they're out, uh, it will make it easier for them to um, get into the workforce. And also, uh, last session we passed what was called Raise the Age, uh, which uh, basically affected 17 and 18 year olds that commit crimes. Uh, they could have been treated as adults prior to this legislation. This clarifies that they're still an underage offender. Uh, we ensured with funding uh, that that program can be implemented. Um, something we did with elections, I know that many people are hearing a lot about election security right now, the idea of mail-in elections, uh, all of that's being discussed. Uh, we passed an election bill that clarifies all of this for the state of North Carolina. First, it prevents a mail-only election. It clearly said that Governor Cooper or the State Board of Elections cannot order a mail-in only election. We have to have an election in our current format. And there's different ways in North Carolina that you can vote. You can vote absentee, which that is by mail. And this piece of legislation clarified how you can turn in a request form for that. You can also vote during early voting. Uh, and there are some different things that are happening currently with clarifying early voting with uh, sites. Um, and that information can be found at your local Board of Elections site, uh, Wilkes Board of Elections and Alexander Board of Elections. Um, and also, it helped with funding for this because we're expecting an uptick in uh, mail-in ballots just because of the nature of the pandemic. Uh, also, an increased use at the early sites and also for protective equipment on election day itself. So this provided funding to the local level so they will have the monies to be able to pay for some of the changes that they will have to do. Now some things that dealt with uh, constitutional protections that we dealt with. We passed something called the Second Amendment Protection Act. This was clarifying some of the gun laws that exist in North Carolina. The major piece of this was dealing with uh, Christian schools. Right now the way that the um, statute is written is that you are not allowed to carry on educational property 
Well, many of the Christian schools are on the same piece of property as the church itself. Well, the churches you are allowed to carry concealed, but because they have a school on their church, at their church, they're not allowed to. This law would clarify that. Uh, it passed with good support in both chambers, but not enough to overcome the veto from Governor Cooper. Uh, after he vetoed the bill, it came back to the chamber and we were unable to override. Also, I mentioned before about the role of Governor Cooper's powers. Uh, we sent a um, piece of legislation called Clarify Emergency Powers Act. This was Senate Bill 105. And what this did, this clarified in statute the process for the declaration of an emergency because what has happened with COVID-19. And basically what the bill said was that yes, the governor could declare a state of emergency and it could hold for a certain time period. But after that time period, if it was to be continued, he had to get approval of the Council of State. Uh, the Council of State is made up of folks that are elected statewide. This would be your state auditor, a state treasurer, secretary of state, uh, secretary of agriculture. Those positions are all elected statewide and we felt like that would give some checks and balances to the emergency power declaration. Uh, this bill passed both chambers, but it was vetoed by Governor Cooper and we were unable to override his veto. That is the overview of all of the legislation that was passed and some explanation on how we have reacted to COVID-19. Uh, we are still, it has many moving parts uh, and we are still dealing with it uh, as we move into the fall here. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, always feel free to contact my office, especially dealing with unemployment benefits. Uh, we have found over this time period that the processing of unemployment benefits has been um, very slow for many people uh, and it's been very difficult. Uh, if you are having those kind of problems, please feel free to contact the office to where we can help you with that process. And if you have any questions and concerns, again, always feel free to contact me and we can try to get you an answer. Uh, I appreciate uh, you um, listening and uh, having the opportunity to share with you what has gone on over the summer from Raleigh.